the next uh, talk is given by uh, Professor Ralph Hall. Uh, he's a uh, professor at University of Minnesota Law School, and uh, he's also a consul at uh, Baker and Daniels, and also he's the CEO of the company MR3 Medical um, Company that makes medical devices. And he is in uh, uh, various places. He's been, uh, uh, again, various capacities. I think we are very lucky to have uh, Professor uh, Ralph Hall uh, to give us and uh, talking about uh, regulating nanotechnology. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, Dr. Lieberman started to build the bridge from the scientific shore. I'm going to try to build the bridge from the legal shore. Um, in the next 40 minutes, we're going to try to give a legal primer for the issues of regulation. And we're going to try to cover really three basic themes or three subjects in this. The first is a high-level overview of regulatory theory and regulatory approaches, kind of the toolbox. How can we regulate when those kinds of things? Spend some time on definitions, because those are critical to lawyers, and then a very high-level view of current regulatory structures that may have some applicability to nanotechnology. Uh, for the lawyers in the crowd, you will cringe when we go through this high-level overview because we are taking what is literally a course or two or three, and we're doing it in 10 minutes. Right? There will be a quiz, however. Um, I'm going to start with something I hope not to spend much time on, and that's the question of why should scientists, technicians, clinicians care about this? Um, if it's not self-evident that the ethical, legal, social implications of nanotechnology are going to be key to its regulation, and key to its use, key to its acceptance. Um, then you have to look at situations like Gelsinger, a, uh, an individual who died a number of years ago as part of a gene therapy trial. And because of that, gene therapy research and applications were set back 15 years or more. We are still uh, reacting to that. <laughs> Law hates a, a vacuum. and. We will, my world of, of lawyers, we will figure out ways to regulate things that need to be regulated, and either you can help us do it, or we'll do it ourselves and we'll screw it up. Right? And so all the complaining you want to do about lawyers, this is your chance really to help us sort out what regulation is needed, what's logical, and what's appropriate. Um, regulation at the highest level is really a public consensus that pulls together a variety of interests. This is only a partial list, right? Ethics, views of the benefits of technology, the level of trust in science and in scientists. Right? And that's taken some shots recently, folks. The whole vaccine autism issue, right? And all the controversies surrounding that. If people do not have trust in science, or trust in scientists, that's going to affect regulation. Same thing about the views of industry. Um, also, don't underestimate the value people place on autonomy, personal decision making, those kinds of things. And if you think about nanotechnology, and this is only a partial list, by the way, it cuts across huge numbers of legal fields, intellectual property, regulation of research, and by the way, academic researchers are some of the worst people for complying with laws and regulations of any group out there. All right, sorry about that, but that's just a, a fact, right? Uh, product approvals, product uses, subcategories there of who, expert use, academicians, physicians, scientists, whomever, versus consumer uses, advertising, promotion, international trade, investor issues. Homeland security, all these areas are touched by nanotechnology and the potential interaction with the legal areas. And as you think about this, very simplistically, understand that as we talk about regulation, do we regulate, how do we regulate, what do we regulate, we are balancing a tremendous number of factors. My area of, of primary work is in food and drug law. So I kind of come to it from that perspective. And so among the things we're balancing are new uses, new therapies, 
right? Whether it's for cancer treatments or baseball bats, right? And the faster we make the technology available to people means that there is less research that will have been done. Conversely, you have patient access or consumer access issues. If it's a cancer therapy, how long do you want to study it before people get the benefit of that? Safety. The more research we do, the higher a safety level or knowledge we may have, but the slower either approval or access of con that the, the product has to those who need the product. And obviously, cost of the regulatory system, the cost that this imposes. If you put too high a requirements on safety, the cost profile becomes such that innovators won't get into the field. And these are all policy issues that have to be balanced, and logical regulation is designed to take all of this into account. And this is, again, where, where the scientific world can help us in understanding how these fit together. Um, as you think about this also, my world of law and regulation is much more looking at total product life cycle. It's a relatively recent development, by recent meaning the last five to ten years. This happens to be a slide that, with permission, I stole from the Centers for Devices and Radiological Health, part of FDA, and this is how they're looking at regulation now, right? Beginning with concept, prototypes, what a lot of the people in here do, a lot of the poster sessions, right? They're up in here, but that's where the FDA is starting to think about regulation. Preclinical, clinical manufacturing, market, commercial use, obsolescence, and disposal. So we're looking at this much more holistically. Now, this is a change, and we'll talk a bit more about this, from where things were in the past. In the past, we had much more of a balkanized system, but this is where regulatory agencies and current regulatory thought is going. Along these lines, some of the things I'm going to be talking about um, are the result of some grant activities at the University of Minnesota, a National Science Foundation grant on assessing regulatory oversight models for nanotechnology, um, a current NIH grant studying uh, human research and nanotechnology. So I just want to acknowledge uh, those grant sources uh, for some of the work that you're going to see here. So what do we have here? Is nanotechnology just another new technology? Right? We've had lots of new technologies over my life. Right? In the spirit of full disclosure, I am not a scientist. I took high school science back several decades, well, many decades ago. I got pretty good grades. I declared victory over the sciences, and I moved on. All right? But I've heard in, in you know, the, the decades I've been around, we've had lots of new technologies, right? Is this just another new technology? Is there something unique, something special about nanotechnology that requires my world to think differently? And that's where your world has to help us. Is nanotechnology even new? Hmm. And I'll go to this last point. Nanoparticles, things less than 100 you know, nanometers, have existed since the dawn of time, right? We've had nanocarbon particle, people tell me, floating around since the Big Bang. What that means is that in one sense, we're asking the question about a, an amazing new technology that are doing things that we haven't thought about before, but also the same items also may meet the definition of things that have existed for billions of years. So in a sense, we're trying to regulate new, we're trying to regulate old. Right? Carbon nanotubes have existed. Right? Maybe not as purified, maybe not as confident, but they've existed. Right? Nanoparticles have existed. Is this even new? Now, why is that important? If it's not new, then do the existing regulatory structures fit our, our needs? If it is new, what's new about it and what parts do we need to regulate from that? And as you think about it, obviously risk and benefits. We talk about nanotechnology often as this unified whole. Well, it's probably not that. There are probably subsets that may need very different assessment or regulation. 
What role do stakeholders play? Where's the public? Where are consumers? Where are patients? Right. What role should they play? There's also the question, is this, should this be a global regulatory scheme, a national regulatory scheme, or a local? Berkeley, California has passed city ordinances regulating nanotechnology. Cambridge has proposed, they've been debating some of these, right? Is this local, is it state, is it national, is it global? And with international trade, the global question becomes much more interesting. Now, some regulatory theory, 101. As you think about this, this is a simplistic way to start to think about it, a little bit of a schema uh, for us to use. Do we need to provide oversight or regulation, right? What are we trying to regulate? What's the risk we're trying to regulate? What's the need we're trying to fulfill? Why do we want to regulate, right? Secondly, what is it that we're trying to regulate? What's the activity or what's the item? Let me stop there. There's a tremendous difference between regulating activity and regulating a physical article. Very different approaches, very different implications. What are your information needs, your testing needs, right? Um, labeling needs, all sorts. This is the information step, right? Then your method of regulation. There are many, many approaches to regulation that we will talk about. This is, again, not a one-size-fits-all. And as part of this, a fascinating question in my mind is balancing certainty and flexibility. Anybody here complain about some stupid regulation or piece of paper that you have to fill out because the bureaucrats say you have to fill it out? Right? No one's ever said that before. Okay. Anybody here work in academia? All right. Have you said that before? Okay. What you have there is a system that advocates and promotes certainty over flexibility, right? You can have other systems that promote flexibility over certainty. And here, by the way, is where industry often gets very confused. On the one hand, they say, just tell us the rules, right? And we'll do it. We've got to stand our head in the corner on Tuesday mornings and sing the Star Spangled Banner, just tell us, we'll do it. Then they say, well, wait, we need flexibility. And so you have this whole question of certainty versus flexibility. Now, if you tell my world we need to regulate, we've got to do a couple of things. We've got to define the item or the activity to be regulated. I'm going to spend some time on this. I'll give you a hint here. Scientific definitions often don't need, meet the needs that we have in my world for legal requirements. Who's going to regulate it? State? Local, federal, centralized, decentralized, a new agency divided up among existing agencies. And by the way, there are people that have advocated creating a federal agency for nanotechnology. Right. Then what's your regulatory approach? Hard to soft, some terms I'll use in a, in a bit. Is it pre-market, is it post-market? What's the role of the consumer and uh, patient in terms of autonomy and choice. Right? Understand the importance of choice here. Right? One way to regulate is to say, we will give you the information, and then you can decide whether you want to use the product. That maximizes autonomy or choice. Now, there are a number of different regulatory approaches. This is high level. One is information disclosure. We, we will force people to tell you the user-consumer information that you then can use to safeguard yourself, to decide whether you want to use the product, whatever. Examples of that, material safety data sheets. People here work in a laboratory, some of you. Do you have MSDSs available? Anybody ever read one? Good, good. Uh, labeling. Right. We will tell you this product contains nanomaterials. You then can decide what you want to do. We can regulate activity. This can range from limitations to complete bans. Right? You saw this debate in stem cell research. Right? People advocating bans, people advocating limitations, whatever it happens to be. And this can take place any part of the spectrum, from the upfront research to end-of-life disposal issues. Right? So 
a lot of environmental laws regulate disposal activities. Right? So that's one approach. Another is to regulate use. Who can use it, under what circumstances, et cetera. A lot of you know, pharmaceuticals, a lot of medical devices are regulating use. Um, the Consumer Product Safety Commission arguably can regulate use. There's another whole approach, which is to regulate exposure levels. Right? We cannot allow workers to be exposed to more than five parts per million of whatever it happens to be. Right? Or water levels, air levels. Right? We don't care what your activity is as long as you don't create worker exposure more than you know, five parts per million. And we can regulate marketing activities. You need pre-market approval. There's limits on what you can promote. There's limits on what you can say. These are all different regulatory approaches that you can take once you've crossed the Rubicon of saying that something needs to be regulated. Right. Now, this is some work we're, we're doing at Minnesota right now. Um, you're getting some advanced knowledge here. This will be in a publication, uh, we believe, in December or January looking at what we call dynamic oversight, because your world creates a problem for us. I'm, I'm viewing all of you as the scientist types, right? The law lags science. You're always ahead of us. It's the nature of the beast, right? So part of our challenge is when and how do we react to the new stuff you come up with? And you, people pay, have been watching the mammogram controversy, 40, 50. So the, the, the big report comes out of the U.S. Um, Preventive Services Task Force saying 50, not 40. A lot of controversy. Early March, a report comes out of Scandinavia, Denmark, and Norway saying mammograms aren't useful at all. A week later, a British report saying you're all wrong. It's, it's critically important. I'm the lawyer, right? I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a cancer specialist. How do we react to all this changing information? Right? We are slower than you are, and we require, generally speaking, higher levels of certainty. So one of the things we're talking about here is how do we have a scale that moves between softer approaches, voluntary codes, information, to harder approaches, bans, moratoriums, limitations, et cetera, in an area of constantly changing information. We are very good at regulating yesterday. We're not real good at regulating tomorrow. And if you look at the history of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, going back to 1906, we regulate after the fact based upon dead bodies or deformed babies. Right? It's not the most pleasant way to think about it, but it's reality. That's what we react to. And this is an effort to try to get ahead of that, trying to integrate soft and hard approaches, with coordination among stakeholders, regulatory agencies, et cetera, with a life cycle approach, with public engagement and public involvement throughout this. Now, that's regulatory theory 101. Should we regulate it? What is it we want to regulate? How do we want to regulate it? Okay. The first step, once we pass the initial point of, of should we do something, is we've got to define it. Right? So we must define uh, nanotechnology if we're going to regulate it. There's no agreed upon definition. These are three definitions pulled from reputable sources, National Nanotech Initiative, European Commission, Friends of the Earth, and they're all different. And by the way, even if you want to pick one of these, I'll show you in a second, none of these are at all adequate for people like me. Let's look at this. Nanotechnology is the understanding and control of matter at dimensions between approximately 1 and 100 nanometers. Stop. Right? What did Dr. Lieberman point out to us? Yeah, size can be important, but it can be shape, structure, right? Is that in this definition? No, we look at size. Once again, you folks are ahead of us right? with this. Unique phenomena naming novel applications as a subcategory, imaging, measuring, modeling, and manipulating. Okay. European Commission, manipulation, precise placement, measurement, modeling, manufacture. By the way, with these definitions, all of you are regulated. 
because you're involved in the understanding of matter at these levels. Congratulations. The friends of the Earth say 300 is the right number, not 100. Right? By the way, I have no idea what the right number is. Remember I was a history major? You want to talk about Roman history, we can talk. Right? This is not, you know, my area. So let's take the NNI and understand how this fails completely to meet our needs. We're going to regulate understanding. Can't regulate understanding. So if I want to read, a, if I go over there to, to look at some of the poster sessions, you're regulating me. Control. What is approximately? Do lawyers love words like approximately? Oh, yes. It's called business, folks. <laughs> approximately one in 100 unique. What does unique mean? Right? What's novel? We're going to regulate imaging, measuring, modeling. This definition doesn't work. Let's just take a very simplistic 100 nanometer line, right? What do you do with these three products? One has 90% of the particles less than 100 nanometers, one has 50%, and one has 10%. Right? Real life, isn't it? If I even have this line of 100 nanometers, what do I do with, with these products? Right? And if you believe that people are unscrupulous, and if you say, well, it's got to be more than 50%, what am I going to do? It'll be 51% or be up, you know, greater than 100, right? So understand the, the problems that we've got here in defining what you're going to regulate. Now, by the way, why 100 nanometers um, with this National Science Foundation grant, we had a meeting in April, and some of the scientists there said, 100 nanometers, that's, quote, silly, that's, quote, stupid. They used other words, which I will not use, right, to describe this 100 nanometer line. Why 100? It's a nice round number, right? Do we need different levels to pay based upon where toxicity or changes in features kick in. For one product, it might be 300. For another, it might be 50. Maybe it's 500. Maybe it's 150. Right? We don't know. We've talked about approximately unique, et cetera. Uh, this is a slide I took from somebody else with permission that looks at cube size versus surface area. And you see this dramatic change in surface area right, with decreasing cube size. Where on this curve, if, if size is the only requirement, right, where along this curve do you want to kick in regulation? Do you want to kick in regulation where you start to, this is basically flat here, asymptotic, right? Do you want to start it around here or where the shoulder really goes or when you get up here? Now, you've got two choices, folks. Choice one, you can help us sort this out. Right? Choice two, you can let me decide. Scares you, doesn't it, John? <laughs> right? this, this, you know, Kathy talked about bridges being very serious. These are the bridges we need. Because remember the law of Horbes, uh, a vacuum. We will fill this vacuum. Right? Don't make us, but we will. Because we have no choice. Key regulatory structures. This is how we currently regulate. Um, OSHA, NIOSH, Workplace Safety, EPA, Environmental, TSCA, Toxic Substance Control Act, Use of New Chemicals. Um, how many people thought we'd talk about FIFRA today? People here know FIFRA? The Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. One of my favorites. FDA, Consumer Product Safety Commission, Gene Therapy. Let's look at OSHA. OSHA has really three core approaches to regulation when you boil it all down, right? One is the so-called general duty clause. The employer has an obligation to provide a safe workplace. By the way, that applies to Notre Dame. Then you've got very specific standards, technology requirements, et cetera, no more than five parts per million. You must have this protective equipment, whatever. And then information disclosures. This is a wonderful example of some of the different regulatory theories we've talked about. 
The advantage of the general duty clause is it's incredibly flexible and has almost no certainty before the fact certainty. The advantage of the specific standards is it's incredibly specific and certain, but has no flexibility. Right? See how we're playing these off and how this is a critical distinction. And then you got information disclosure, which maximizes autonomy interests by saying, we will give you information, knock yourself out, do what you want. So we've got a lot of workplace exposure limits right now, particles, et cetera. Those were set often 30 years ago or so, before there was much understanding of nanotechnology. The protective systems we have in place were based upon 1970s, 1980s level technology and knowledge, right? Do we need to go back and set new exposure levels? Well, A, you've got to tell me what we're regulating first. Is it 100? Is it 500? Is it 10? What is nanotechnology? And what am I worried about? And remember, a lot of our systems were created for very different particle sizes. Now, the other particle size probably existed. We just didn't know about it. Or we didn't understand the importance uh, or the difference. Then you've got to ask me the question, is there a legal basis for differentiating the same chemical based on size? Can I have a five part per million exposure level for greater than 500 and a one part per million for a less than 500? And these are all issues that we're struggling with. Another one that I think, again, Dr. Lieberman's talk uh, really pointed out to us, and that's under TSCA. <coughs> TSCA essentially requires prior notification of the use of a quote unquote new chemical substance. And if you've got a new chemical substance, you may have to do various testing or there are various control things, right? Chemical substance, now TSCA was written back before I was a lawyer. Um, so it's a long time ago, back 30 plus years ago. And we define chemical substance as any organic or inorganic substance of a particular molecular identity. We thought we were being really smart, right? right? Carbon is well known, correct? Is carbon a new chemical? Well, are carbon nanotubes a new chemical substance? Well. There's a concern that carbon nanotubes of a particular size may have asbestos-type properties, all right? Does TSCA apply? Do we need to go through the pre-market notification for carbon nanotubes? But don't they have the same molecular identity as carbon that's already out there? What is molecular identity? And you see how your world screws my world up? We thought we had this under control. Right. And you can go through this for compound after compound after compound. Right. And this requires us to define what is a, you know, a molecular identity. Right. Now, EPA has said very recently that TSCA does apply to carbon nanotubes. And so they are making it go through certain TSCA processes. Is this legally supportable? And number two, is this going to apply to everything? Right. As you come out with a different carbon nanotube, right, is that going to be then a new chemical entity requiring all the Tosca stuff? Or are we going to bucket all carbon nanotubes as a standalone new chemical substance? If every time you come up with a new carbon nanotube, You've got to go through TSCA. What are we doing to innovation? Right. See how we're balancing this stuff. But I have to work within a legal structure that has molecular identity as the key entry point. FDA. FDA um, has been looking at, at, at nanotechnology. 2007, they came out with a report. I think tomorrow we're going to hear from an FDA official, Carlos Pena, uh, who's active in that. Um, nanotechnology is not new to FDA. Now, the words might be, but they've been dealing with compounds that are, 
that may meet the definition of nanoparticles for some time. And they've already approved or permitted the marketing <coughs> of multiple products that have nano characteristics. We'll talk a bit about silver nanoparticles, engineered calcium phosphates, liposomes, et cetera, et cetera. We've identified several hundred products that have already gone through FDA processes that contain nanoparticles. I will guarantee you that list is wrong, right? Those are the ones we just find. There's also a lead, I've not seen it, a, 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 somebody say that a general counsel of a company put out a memo saying, do not call any product nano because that'll just get more attention on it. Right. The biggest nano product that's gotten a lot of attention was in Europe, Nano Magic. It was a cleaning thing for bathrooms. Actually didn't have a single nanoparticle in it. They, for marketing reasons, they put the word nano in there. So we need to be careful. But FDA's already approved a number of these. And no unique safety issues have, have popped up yet. Right. And remember how we've historically regulated, which is by dead bodies. FDA has concluded that current systems are currently adequate, but they have to have more knowledge, and they've got to keep on top of the um, science. Now, by the way, nanotechnology cuts across everything FDA regulates, drugs, cosmetics, devices, food additives, et cetera. This is actually from the FDA task force report. Many approved products currently on the market have stuff in the nanoscale range. Most drugs act at their site of action as individual molecules that are in the nano size range. Does it make a difference for regulatory purposes whether it's nano size at the point of ingestion or nano size at the point of biological interaction? Interesting definitional problem, isn't it? And if it's at the point of interaction, then aren't all drugs nano drugs? Now, Definitions in FDA determine the regulatory pathways. FDA does not regulate everything alike. Again, this is where lawyers will, will, will quake when I go through this. Food and cosmetics generally are after the fact regulation. It's illegal to sell an adulterated, misproduct, misbranded product. Food additives require a pre market approval. <coughs> food contact substances are in between. When is something a food additive versus a food? Right, interesting definitional question. New drugs required a new drug application, pre-market authority, extensive testing. Devices have three classes. Right? One of them, the medium risk class two, you get on the market if you show that you are substantially equivalent to a product already on the market. If I have a nano version of an old product, am I still substantially equivalent? Unanswered questions, by the way, folks. This is what we're getting into. And even when is something a drug or a device? Now, these uh, definitions make a tremendous difference. Generally speaking, time to get to market. If I'm defined as a drug, my ante is three quarters of a billion dollars, and it goes up from there, eight to 10 years. If I'm defined as a cosmetic, it's two years, about $5 million, right? I've got a sunscreen that I'm using to reduce the risk of sunburn and long-term risk of cancer. Am I a drug or a, or a cosmetic? Depends on how I, I word it, right? I'm probably, I may well be a drug. So, but if I say, use my sunscreen, you won't have that goofy white stuff on your face and you'll look better, I'm a cosmetic by how I change my description of my product, I'm either here or here. Right? Words are important in my world. Uh, again, these are clinical trial sizes. Again, approximations. These are why definitions are important. Note here, I've added another level of definition. The first definition debate was what is nanotechnology, nanoparticle, nanomaterial. Then when you take those elements, those materials, and you apply them to existing regulatory structures, you then have another level of definitional challenges. TOSCA, what's a new chemical substance? FDA, what's a new drug? What is substantially equivalent? Um, later today, there'll be another talk that I'm part of 
Um, do nanoparticles act chemically? This is just a setup for that talk. Um, drugs work chemically, devices work mechanically or physically. At the nano level, what's the difference between chemistry and physics? There isn't any. We will talk about this later today. Um, when you think about this, this is a lawyer's view of a cell. Don't laugh. Right? And this is also a lawyer's view of how products like Prozac work, where basically the drug binds to a receptor in the cell, therefore preventing, in the case of Prozac or Zoloft, the serotonin from binding to the receptor site and therefore being taken into the cell, right? Does this, if I have a nanoparticle that blocks that receptor, does the same thing, right? What am I? This is what we'll talk about. But this is an area. And by the way, in a, un, a product that is otherwise unremarkable, a mouthwash called decapinol. FDA said decapinol is a device because it blocks the enamel on the teeth so that the bacteria can't attach to it. If decapinol is a device, isn't Prozac a device? Ah, what a tangled web we weave. This is a, um, a slide taken from the FDA, and this is the process for a new drug application. Right? The reason I'm showing you this is also to demonstrate once we decide to regulate nanotechnology, <clears throat> if we have a nano drug that's going through the system, the number of places that we affect the system. This is the law of unintended consequences, right? I have circled what I can think of as the places where nanotechnology regulation will have a specific effect on the process of new drug testing beginning with initial preclinical research, laboratory synthesis, purification, animal testing, IRBs, clinical testing, et cetera. EPA, right, they regulate technology concentration or exposure, a lot of uh, acts there. They have a lot of existing standards. Do those need to be amended? either conceptually or specifically for nanotechnology. And if we get into that, what about size and what about shape? Consumer Product Safety Commission has really been a toothless tiger for 30 years. That's been revised. Um, they have authority for consumer products to require testing, labeling, and recall. OK, let's finish up here. Let's take a look at nano silver. Regular silver is inert. Nano silver is biologically very active. We already have nano silver in products from washing machines to medical devices to bandages, heart valves there. Um, this is a list <coughs> of the agencies already involved in nano silver regulation. And I probably missed a couple. All right. So the question is then should these be consistent? Should we have a uniform approach to nano silver? And if so, what does that look like? So understand that the legal regulatory oversight is the end result of a policy debate that hopefully you'll play a role in. We can screw this up by over-regulating or under-regulating. And the key issues that we face here are definitional issues, testing issues, labeling, risk identification, and benefit. OK? Thank you. That's a very legitimate argument, by the way, that a number of people have made. And this goes, is nanotechnology really anything new? Can, do the existing systems have the appropriate um, 
uh, oversight um, elements and requirements to provide whatever public safety, public benefit we want. Um, and there are a number of groups that say exactly that, that we don't need standalone specific nanotech regulation. And that's an open, I mean, that's, I mean, I, I hope I started off this with the question, do we need to regulate? You can regulate by, by particle size, okay? That is a, a regulatory approach you see in Clean Air Act, yes. um, and that can be something we can adopt here. Yes, but you can expand it that sure. particular one a lot easier right. to expand an existing policy. Yes. And then you get the question of, can I, if, if I'm making the product as compared to emitting, can I game the system? Yes, starting point. Right, yeah. I'm not sure how many people realize in here, but when I started practicing medicine, the number of drugs that physicians use on a day-to-day -day basis that are actually approved for the uses that we use them for is really about 30%. When the medicines were prescribed on a routine basis, they were approved for something else. And that's called off-label prescribing. That's the, 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 you've got to ask yourself the question, because how, how much restrictions we want to go on our medical practitioners, that's an entirely separate question, but it's embedded in this question. Roughly 70 to 75 percent of all drugs taken by children are for unapproved uses, right? But Congress and everybody, the American Medical Asso Association, have all said you cannot regulate our off-label use. Well, but, but I, I actually had this debate with some of my professors. I said, can we actually restrict these medicines? Because sometimes we're up against a wall and we don't know what to do. And then this, you're absolutely correct, because this gets to the interesting interaction between regulatory systems. So if I get a patent for a particular carbon nanotube, it's got to be new, non-obvious, et cetera. Does that mean I've then made an admission under TSCA that it's a new chemical substance? So you have these interesting interactions that really haven't been thought through completely. <laughs> 